Hello and welcome to part two of four of a long patrol which has been divided up on how jet powered aircraft affected naval tactics and strategy. Part one was establishing the baseline and discussing the initial characters like Casper John. Part two is the Korean War. And I rather like the Korean War. As wars go, it's um, a fairly interesting one. Which sounds terrible when you're describing something which involves the deaths of so many thousands of people and the ruining of an entire civilization, pretty much. And the asserting re is rebuilding, but... To an extent, being a professional historian, you get a little bit desensitized to it. But also, there is the fact that when you're using the phrase interesting to describe a war, you're basically saying, well, this war was slightly more complicated than the usual reasons for why it happens. It's not just a straight up case of greed. Most wars, you can, when you boil them down, become a straight-up case of greed, or avarice. Korean War, that's not. So, what classes of uh, carriers really come to the fore in us? Well, I did mention, of course, HMS Unicorn goes out there, and we all know some various fun stories of HMS Unicorn getting involved in the Korean War with her four-inch gun batteries, basically going, Hello, sure target. You are blowing at me, firing at me. I will fire at you. I am, after all, one of Henderson's carriers. I believe in taking the fights to the enemy myself. But... This is the War of the Light Fleet Carrier. The 1942 Light Fleet Carriers. You have Glory, Ocean, Pioneer, Theseus, Triumph, and Perseus. Now, Pioneer and Perseus are maintenance carriers a la Unicorn, so if they turn up anywhere, it's not to do fighting. They're turning up as support ships. But the others, they are very much the carriers which will lead, and I emphasize this, lead the British efforts in the Korean War. Now, they entered service at various times, but you've got Colossus entered service with the um, French Navy as Armage in 1946. She's only commissioned in 1944. So she serves at the Royal Navy for two years. Glory is commissioned in 1945. It's paid off in 1956, so the year of Suez and scrapped in 1961. So she's in reserve fleet for during Suez. Uh, Ocean is commissioned in 1945. Her commissioning captain is Casper John. And she's paid off in 1960 and scrapped in 1962. Pioneer is commissioned in 1945, February 1945, and is paid off in 54, and scrapped in 54. She's only a maintenance carrier, though, as I've said. Theseus, commissioned in 46, February 1946, paid off in 1957, scrapped in 62. Triumph, commissioned in 46. May 46, paid off in 1975. She was only reclassified as a, rare, a repair ship in 1965. 
So the Royal Navy kept her around for 10 years as a repair ship, as a forward aviation repair ship. So they maintained a forward aviation repair ship till 1975. And she was only scrapped in 1981, so I'm trying, possibly trying to keep her around for longer than that. And Perseus. Commissioned in 45, paid off in 57, scrapped in 58. They are lovely ships. They are the light fleet carriers. They are... Well... Okay. They are 13,200 tons, as they're designed in standard. None of them are actually that. They're supposed to be 18,000 tons full load. Again, none of them actually really accord that. They have about a 210 meter long flight deck. But their length overall is about 212 meters. They have a beam of 24 meters, um, a draft of 7 meters in full load, but 5.6 meters in. They have a draft of 5.6. Six meters in standard. They are powered by four Admiralty free drum boilers, which generate forty thousand shaft horsepower and drive two propeller shafts. So they are based on HMS Unicorn. These are the ones. This is the Unicorn design orientated around actually producing technically a fighting ship rather than what was technically a forward aviation support ship. Uh, their top speed is 25 knots, their range 12,000 nautical miles, that's um, 22,000 kilometers roughly apparently, at 14 knots. But they do require a fa over a thousand crew, <laughs> they're not that heavily armed, and whilst they can carry up to 52 aircraft, that's 52 aircraft as designed in 1945, with the aircraft of the dimensions of the aircraft in 1945. Jet aircraft and even post-war propeller aircraft grow in size and continue to do so. This is one of the big factors when you're designing your aircraft carriers. So anytime anyone stands there and goes, Oh, we could have fitted the same size air group in a smaller carrier. Yes, you could. But next generation of aircraft along, that carrier's air group's going to be shrunk through the floor. And if you've got a slightly bigger carrier, you might just about maintain it. Which is, again, why I would have liked the Queen Elizabeth to be slightly bigger. I'm not talking massively bigger. I'm just talking big enough that they'd actually be longer than the Russian carrier. And that's literally, that is entirely because I want them to have the spare carriage capacity to maintain their air group a few through generations, not because I just want to do one better than Putin. As you can see, most of the rest of the carriers go off, and so this carrier actually go off and provide the West with their fleet carriers. It's the Royal Australian Navy, the Royal Canadian Navy, the Indian Navy. Yes, the French do get Colossus. And the Argentine Navy end up with a, a, a couple of them. And the Brazilian Navy gets Minas Grias, which serves till 2001. Which is very, very good. Not the record for a uh, light fleet carrier offspring design, but, you know, very good. These ships had all been completed at the end of World War II, or near enough. They were pretty much brand spanking new. 
Some of them had seen action, but not much. So this is what the Royal Navy is relying on up until the point of Korea uh, to Korea. So five or six years later, these are the carriers which are the backbone of the Royal Navy. There are also some other World War Two vintage carriers wandering around and. Again, I cannot emphasize this HMS Unicorn. There's all sorts of things wandering around. The Royal Navy has a lot of naval aviation capability. Not on the same scale as the American Navy. But pretty much every Navy, other Navy in the world was going, it would take three of us to match you. In that kind of voice. Because it would. In the 1950s, Late 1940s, early 1950s, you are very much looking at this as a scenario where there is the US Navy at the top, largest Navy in the world. They've got the bank balance to support it. Well, everyone's in debt to them, so they can, they're paying to support it. And then the ones below that are the Royal Navy. And then below that... Probably some of the Western navies, and then the Russian navy, which is slowly coming up, but, you know. So, the air groups. What are the air groups composed of? Well, let's think about the Supermarine Spitfire. Well, Seafire. But let's be honest. That particular Seafire is very, very similar to... Um, yeah, very, very similar to the equivalent Spitfire at the time. If it's the it's the FR Mark Forty Seven, and it's it's kind of a navalized Mark Twenty Four from memory. It's powerful. Simple, and it's 47s with 800 squadron that see action aboard HMS Triumph during the Malayan emergency of 1949 and the Korean War in 1950. A good aircraft, but Not really what you should be in, and not really what you would want to be in if you could choose to be in something else. Anything else, pretty much. The Spitfire Mark 47 has a wingspan of 11, and a, 11 meters, 25 centimeters, so 36 feet, a little bit over. Folded span of 5.82 meters or 19 feet and an inch. All up weight with whilst clean of stores is about 10,700 pounds or 4.8 tons roughly. But they with could carry a fifty gallon drop tank and two five hundred pound bombs, so um that would raise it up to twelve and a half thousand pounds or um near enough makes no difference five point seven tons powered by Rolls Royce Griffin eighty eight that gave them two thousand three hundred fifty horsepower at Roughly 1,200 feet. A top speed of 452 miles per hour at 20,000 feet. And they were able to climb at 4,800 feet per minute. So they had a really fast rate of climb, which was really very useful for intercepts. They were armed with four 20mm Hispano cannon. And they had a combat range of mm, 405 miles on internal fuel, 
ferry range of uh, 1,475 miles with the 90 maximum 90 gallon drop tank. Which, the, if they were carrying a 90 gallon drop tank, I don't think they could carry the two 500 pound bombs. I'm good. But you also have my favourite, and this one takes part the whole way through the war. And frankly, of the fairy aircraft, I am always happiest to see a Firefly coming my way, because I like the Firefly. Because to me, it's a Fulmar with so many of its things fixed, even though it isn't really a Fulmar. It's powered by a Rolls-Royce Griffin. It has a four-bladed Robo Constancy propeller. A crew of two. It's got a... Um, when it's stripped for the final mission, its total weight is... Again, near enough to make some difference, 5.8 tons. And when in the non-fighter mission, i.e. suppression of enemy air power of or attack or anti-submarine operations it's um a little over six tons good got 386 miles an hour at fourteen thousand feet had a cruising speed of 209 miles per hour And on that, at that speed, it could, um, on internal fuel alone, uh, have a combat range of 760 miles and a ferry range with two 90 gallon tanks. This is an Imperial gallons, by the way, of 1,335 miles. Although, it would take it. Three minutes and thirty-six seconds to reach five thousand feet, so uh, a little bit slower on the climb than the Seafire, and but still, four twenty millimeter Hispano cannon could take sixteen rockets or two thousand pound bombs, and fully equipped with radar, radio, and night flying instrumentations. So, basically, your night attack aircraft. Day attack aircraft. Ooh, what are we talking about next? Oh, the Sea Fury, which is what replaces the the Sea Fire. And the Hawker Sea Fury is cute. Hawker Sea Fury, of course, managed to shoot down a jet during the Korean War, and has a few other tricks up its sleeve as well. It's one of the fastest aircraft built. It is certainly the fastest available for the Royal Navy at the time, which is why they build it. Its maximum speed is 460 miles per hour at 18,000 feet. It can do 780 miles in its combat range. And it's got a ferry range with two small drop tanks of 904 miles. It has, again, the lovely 420mm uh, cannon. Noticing a pattern here? 420mm cannon. It can carry 12 rockets and uh, 2,000 pounds worth of bombs. It was supposed to be produced as the Fury to replace the Hawker Typhoon and Hawker Tempest. In reality, it was always billed as just replacing the Tempest, but it's probably replaced the Typhoon as well. But in the end, the RAF decide they've got enough legacy aircraft, they can afford to wait till they get the jet aircraft in. The Royal Navy, which is looking at its scenario and going, Seafire's written, no matter how much we do them, don't really have the legs for carrier landings, and we're getting really, really worried. And, oh, some of these aircraft, we have criteria for exactly how many metal strips we can apply to various parts and hold them together till they fall apart. Yeah. 
let's bring in the Sea Fury. And it works very, very well. As I said, during the Korean War, they take on the ground attack role and air patrols. Um, they conduct 3,900 interceptions. And they also carried out, they were also spotter aircraft for UN artillery. At several points, you have multiple squadrons of Sea Furies operating. over the Korea because they're coming from the fleet air arm of the Royal Navy and the fleet air arm of the Royal Air Australian Navy. And in 1952, when the first MiG-15 jet fighters appear um, in August, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Peter Hoagie Carmichael, flying Sea Fury WJ-232 from HMS Ocean. It's a name which keeps popping up. Was managed to get a shoot down a MiG-15. The occasion occurred when Sea Furies and Fireflies were engaged by eight MiG-15s, during which one Firefly was badly damaged, while the Sea Furies escaped entirely unharmed. There are some sources which do claim a second MiG was downed during the same action, but it's... Um, But you don't know. There is also dispute over whether it was Carmichael or his wingman, but let's be honest, if you've got both aircraft coming up behind a MiG and firing their cannon a blazing over their cannon. What matters is the aircraft shot down, surely. It's kind of difficult to tell also which one the cannon, exact offending cannon rounds came from. And I almost forgot, there's also the AD-4 Sky Raider, which the British start to look at quite seriously. They have a reason for looking at it seriously at this point. Tactics. What are the tactics under development? Well, here you go. There's a picture of HMS Ocean with then Lieutenant Commander Eric Winkle Brown landing a de Havilland Sea Vampire. Now, during the Korean War, the Royal Navy has the same principal tonnage of 20 Sea Vampires, and they go nowhere near combat. They are the Royal Navy's Jet Induction Squadron. They are 700 series. They will go nowhere near combat. 800 series squadrons are the combat ones. 700 are training, testing, support. By this point. Very much confirmed. They're also having to develop things. The carrier's which are going, if we have a quickly flick back to it, look at that deck. It's a long straight deck, which is fine for operating propeller aircraft because they have a relatively low speed of approach. But it's more problematic with jets. Furthermore, as Casper John writes on page 161, the light fleet carriers Triumph, Theseus, Glory, and Ocean were at war in the Korean waters with outdated piston engine aircraft expected to battle with a new menace of communist jet engine aircraft. Yes, fleet air arm did very well. Yes, 
They were flying at night when the jets couldn't fly at night. They were also flying in the daytime when the jets could fly. And yes, I did just tell you, Sea Fury shot one down. At least one down. But Casper is making the case for better aircraft. He's making the case for a better carrier force. Most importantly, they are starting to realize the impact of jet aircraft on the positioning of radar. How far away, with an air, if an aircraft speed of approach is 400 miles an hour, and you can spot them 80 miles out, that is 12 minutes warning. If an aircraft's speed of approach is twelve hundred miles an hour. Well, that's three minutes warning. In the first scenario, I can scramble fighters. I can reorientate my cap quite easily. Even if my cap is sitting on top of my carrier, I can start heading away and it will possibly intercept you at a significant range. If the cap is above the picket which detects you, it can I can send it will do most likely get to you. But if it's a three minute scenario, you'll probably blast straight past that cap. It's becoming a problem. So I need to push my cap out. How am I gonna do this? Well that question will not be answered by the Saunders Row. But it's important to say that they were thinking about jet fighters very seriously, including flying boat jet fighters. It's cool. It's a gorgeous looking aircraft. And yes, occasionally water does go into the jet, and no, it didn't manage to cause a flame out, which is good. But the trouble was for the Saunders Row is that the Royal Navy didn't want to pay for it, and the Royal Air Force didn't need it. Still, it's gorgeous, and I would uh, just imagine the world. We might actually, if the Saunders Road come into service and prove practical, we might now actually have those long, long drawn and thought about fighter aircraft, which can turn into submarines. We've always wanted them in comic books. Saunders Row, SRA one. If this had been uh, been developed, that could have been where it ended up. A missed opportunity for comic book star glory. Ooh, part three. It's going to be a serious crisis. As always, I hope you've enjoyed, and if you do like, please do press the like. So maybe subscribe, press the little bell slightly further along, perhaps join in, uh, join us in Discord, or even Patron. Thank you. Um, hope you join us apart free.